the key to good winemaking is cleanliness. I thought it was important to have a lecture on managing microbial growth, particularly um, spoilage microbes. So my list of terms that go along with this topic are, number one, to disinfect, which is a reduction in microbial numbers. And obviously a disinfectant is a chemical that reduces microbial numbers on specifically on inanimate objects, again, like a countertop or a doorknob or some piece of equipment in the winery. And then to decontaminate is a more general term to reduce both bacterial and chemical hazards together. Sanitize is a more specific term that refers to reducing, not just bacterial, I don't know why I said that, <laughs> microbial numbers to a prescribed health standard. And so you can, um, you know, if you look at a spray bottle of Lysol, for example, it'll say, you know, kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria or viruses or whatever. And so, um, but in order to hit that, you have to really closely read the label and you can see, so to sanitize, this is a Lysol spray, leave for 10 seconds before wiping. And so again, in order to hit that 99.9% .9 reduction, you need to, to leave the spray on for 10 seconds before wiping. And most people probably don't do that. To sterilize means remove all life. And so that usually means it's a pretty harsh form of, steril of, of um, sterilization, either uh, physical or um, like heat or chemical, you know, like a really strong chemical. Antiseptics, um, they're like disinfectants, but the key difference here is these antiseptics can be used on live external tissue such as the skin, you know, it's something you could gargle with, for example. So Listerine is a, an antiseptic. A germicide or a biocide, those are killing agents. And so again, a germicide would be more general purpose, would kill, you know, fungi and bacteria and maybe some viruses, whereas a bactericide specifically kills bacteria, whereas a viricide might specifically kill viruses. The suffix on this term, bacteriostat, is really important because that suggests inhibition as opposed to killing. And so a lot of the chemicals that we use, for example, in, in um, foods are bacteriostats. You know, we add acetic acid or vinegar to mustard, for example, to preserve that product. But they're static agents. They're not, um, the chemicals aren't added to a level that would kill microbes. So one of the things we use in, in terms we use in industry quite a bit is this, the concept of hurdle technology. And really the first bullet point defines it well to de-optimize several factors. But each factor is at a sublethal level, which is important because you're not trying to outright kill the microbe with any one of these factors. The idea is that if you line up several sublethal factors, you, you will kill or inhibit the organism. That's what this silly little cartoon shows. You know, the microbe maybe can kind of exert itself to get over the first hurdle, but it tires it out a little bit, and then it tries to get over the next hurdle. And here's some hypothetical hurdles here. So the pH is suboptimal, but it doesn't kill it. So the microbe kind of gets over that. The water activity is, is, a little, is a little low, meaning that there's not a lot of water available for the microbe's metabolism. And so, you know, the microbe sort of trips on the hurdle a little bit and knocks it, knocks it a bit. Then there might be some preservative in there, like an organic acid and so on. And so eventually the microbe will fall and not make it over the hurdles. But the microbe isn't dead. And I think the important point there is that you don't want to stress the microbe so much that you encourage resistance but, you know, it's just enough to keep the microbial population low because you always have to think about product quality. And usually if you put too much of something in there, too much heat or too much salt or whatever it is, you're going to change the quality. Synergism is what we're, what we're going for here. The combination of inhibitory effects of several factors being greater than the sum of any individual factor. So we want the factors to work together to knock the microbe down and to you know, kick it and punch it in <laughs> different places. Um, and, and obviously we want, like I just said, the desirable texture and, and flavor should be minimally impacted. But the problem is the results of this interplay are really unpredictable. And sometimes you can get synergism, but other times you can get antagonism. And so antagonism is, antagonism 
is the combined inhibitory effect of several factors being actually smaller than the sum of inhibition caused by an in, any individual factor. And so in other words, a bacterium can be more resistant to the second factor after being exposed to the first. And we see that like with a, there's a strain of salmonella that I work with that if you dry it out, it, it, it actually increases its thermal tolerance. But if the microbe isn't dried out, that, that non-dried out, that non-desiccated microbe is much more sensitive to temperature, which is kind of scary, actually. You know, the idea that you have a dried food like a beef jerky or something like that, that the microbe is on, and because the food itself is dry, then it naturally becomes more resistant to heating or something you do later on. And we also see that with zygosaccharomyces, which is a uh, you know, pain in the butt spoilage yeast. And so this is a, an organism where pre-exposure to a mild acid can actually increase its a tolerance to, to stronger acids later in a process. And so zygosac can be a real problem in wineries and, and other places where mild acids are the primary preservative. Um, predictions um, can usually only be made through experimentation, and that's really opened up a cool field called predictive microbiology, where it's really just microbial physiology. Another aspect of managing microbial growth is dealing microbial growth is dealing with biofilms, and um, this is probably one of our biggest problems because killing a microbe that's planktonic, you know, floating around in in wine juice or or that's that's you know that's in water or something like that. It's usually pretty easy. But when, when the microbes get together and form a substrate um, on, a, on a surface, you know, form a film on a surface, they might become much more resistant to killing. They're ubiquitous in nature. I mean, they're on slimy rocks in a stream. They're everywhere. They're on, they can be on catheters. They're, they can be in biofilms in the lining of your intestinal tract. They basically form complex slime-enclosed colonies that attach themselves to surface. And the slime is usually made up of sugar, protein, and DNA. And DNA usually acts as like a rebar, you know, in, like in cement. Um, not that you guys are all masons and cement workers. <laughs> but anyway, the, the idea that DNA is added for that, per, or is included, and seems to play that role of strengthening the matrix. Just looking at the structures that are involved, polysaccharides, proteins, and DNA, it suggests that we could use an enzymatic approach to break these down, and that's what a lot of companies are looking at, ways to enzymatically destroy these things. But I'll talk about some, some ways that we do it um, with caustics and things like that. When um, they form on medical devices, such as you know heart implants and things like that, they can lead to severe illness. And it's, it's obviously... Um, devastating, you know, to have a open heart surgery and somebody gets a valve implanted and then they put them all back together and then you get a relapse where the individual is now infected with something and they have to go back in and take the implant out and 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 sterilize it and put it back in. So these things can be absolutely devastating in the medical devices industry. Um, interactions typically occur among the attached microbes and that's a really neat field of study the physiology of microbes when they're in these complex associations and how they talk to each other and interact and antagonize or work together. But the last bullet point is the most important as far as you know managing microbial growth. It, these biofilms tend to protect the microbes in the consortium from harmful, harmful agents like UV light or antibiotics or, or caustics or whatever you might try to use to clean them out in a winery. So this little um, slide, this cartoon, is basically a uh, um, a picture of a of a biofilm progression, I guess, the ecological succession, if you want to call it that. And so somewhere in, in step one here, you see preconditioning of of this of a surface with some kind of ambient molecules. And in the wine industry, it's residue from grapes and so forth that can build up on a destemmer or whatever. And then um, microbes can actually deposit on that material and, and bind to it and use it as nutrients. Some microbes can um, desorp and you know go back and freely leave the consortium. But often when they get together, they start talking to each other through um, cell cell signaling molecules, which tell often tell each other to make um, polymer exopolymers like the, the sugars that I just mentioned in the proteins and DNA.
And then as a result of that co um, collaborative, collaborative effort, they start to build up polysaccharide production on that surface. And then the surface becomes really difficult to clean. And again, the physiology becomes really exciting and fun to study. But eventually, bits of that can, can slough off. So imagine if this was a, um, a heart valve, for example, and, and this little pile of microbes that has just been sloughed off into the bloodstream can then cause distant infections. A simple way to look at the biofilms and study them is pictured here. It's just you know a simple assay that I use in my lab, for example, where you can put a sterilized glass slide into a, um, a liquid culture of bacteria. And after a period of time, the microbes will settle on the slide and form biofilms. And what we always find, at least with the microbes I work with, and it's probably pretty universal, is that microbes will, will tend to aggregate at the air-liquid interface, so right here. And so you can see each of these little specks is a, is a bacterium. And so this particular biofilm is formed more densely at the top, closest to the air-liquid interface. And that's typically what happens. And so, but imagine then if this is some piece of equipment in a winery. You know, and so the idea that you'd have to then try to sample this typically involved swabbing the surface and plating, or we would use some kind of an ATP analysis or something like that. Where we're, where we're swabbing and either putting that swab into um, culture media to grow something or swabbing and putting that swab into an ATP testing device to look for ATP as a sign that there's living um, microbes present. Now, the, the problem is that ATP test won't give you a distinction <laughs> between what whose ATP it is, but if there's ATP on that surface, that at least suggests to you that something's living there. But generally, you can, you can imagine that this is going to require scrubbing, manual scrubbing with some um, chemical disinfection. So I always like to use this as a, as a classic example of a biofilm. Now, this is something that we want to manage, but in a positive way. But I like the, I, I, I'll explain to you why I'm bringing floor yeast up. But, um, but here's, a, here's a barrel, and you can see the little cutaway here. They put the viewing portal in there. And there's a significant headspace, but yet this is still anaerobic. And the reason for that is, is the, um, the particular yeast in this, in this case will, will form a biofilm, which essentially caps the sherry in this particular example, which caps it to, keeps it, to keep it um, anaerobic and to keep it from oxidizing and turning into vinegar. But... Um, and so the yeasts are actually in this biofilm layer here at the surface. And they, you know, they're in this, in this consortium. They're consuming sugars and drying this product out. And they're consuming any residual glycerol in here to, to sort of make the liquid more delicate and kind of remove some of the body. Um, they're doing one of the big things that they do is increasing acetaldehyde production. So I don't know if you've ever. You know, tasted acetaldehyde individually, but it has a very tart green apple kind of taste, and so it can give the the character, the flavor, and aroma of overripe cider, or you know that kind of thing. Very you know green apple or tart, but but other complex um, flavors can come too. You know, from higher alcohols, for example, from the Ehrlich pathway. If you remember back to the metabolism lecture, and so these these higher alcohols can add aroma and flavor as well. So if you don't remember that, you can refer back to the picture, uh, the slides from the metabolism lecture. But this is just a little bit of the molecular details of how the, um, the floor yeasts are doing this kind of thing. And so um, it's, it's all predicated on the production of a specific protein called flow 11P. And it encodes for, uh, it's, it's basically a hydrophobic protein that the yeasts will produce when they um, start to run out of sugar and nitrogen. And so they'll produce this on their surface. And so, the, and here's the flow 11P. Here's a yeast and its little budding daughter coming off there. And then this guy starts to detect the lack of fermentable carbon and nitrogen. So not the lack, but I mean, it's, it's a significant decrease. There's probably, a, there may be a little residual left. But anyway, the point is, is that they start producing these surface molecules referred to as flow 11P. <clears throat> and these things allow the yeast then to start aggregating. And, and, and so as you see here, the aggregates of yeasts can start trapping CO2 from the fermentation. 
and that cause gives them buoyancy and lifts them up to the surface and then they aggregate and start grabbing on to each other through their through this interaction between their flow 11p um, proteins on their surface that creates cell cell adhesion and so again that then the microbes can do their primary flavoring reactions like converting residual ethanol uh, extra ethanol in this in the medium to acetaldehyde to create the extra complexity and flavors they can also as i said produce the um, fusel alcohols to produce flavor additional flavors so one of the cool things about this this model is and one of the reasons why i'm bringing it up because obviously that's a good thing you know people want that that um, those microbes and so they're not really <laughs> they're interested in managing them but for because they're good um, but this is also a great system for understanding um, fungal biofilm formation and how to block it. And so, again, we don't want to block this particular um, Saccharomyces, the floor yeast and, and sherry production, but we use it as a model for understanding how we might block um, biofilms in spoilage microbes, because spoilage microbes do roughly the same kind of thing in terms of producing proteins on the surface that allow the cells to aggregate. So in this example, this set of research, um, <clears throat> here's the flow 11P, and you can see that mediating cell-cell interaction between yeasts. And so in what, what this group of researchers showed is that the amino acid L-histidine, in this particular case, um, basically caused a physical interaction, almost a, a steric hindrance or a blockage of the flow 11P, and prevented these guys from forming those cell-cell aggregates. Whereas PATH26, <laughs> PATH26 um, is a hydrophobic cationic little peptide that binds to the um, um, flow 11P and actually forms a, acts as a bridge. So the flow 11Ps can, can bind to all these um, PATH26 surfaces now, and that increases the aggregation. So it actually promotes biofilm formation, whereas the histidine, um, acts as a biofilm inhibitor. And so again, this is a, a way that individuals study um, both enhancing or repressing biofilm formation. So for example, knowing this, that there's a chemical that can do this, you may actually enhance sherry production by adding this particular chemical.